Christ at the center. Um, what, one of these is Christ at the center. Is we're gonna look more at kind of the heart, and then excellence will be some more practical things that that we'll cover at the end. So, um, if you have your phone or something like that, it'll be on the screen too. But if you can turn to John chapter three, and we're gonna be in twenty two through thirty six. Yeah. <laughs> It's the British guy. I was listening in a Roman. Nice. Dude, that's a cool voice to have on there. A delight in the Lord. Um, so, uh, John chapter 3, verse 22 through 36. Uh, we'll start by reading just verse 22 through 26, and then we'll move on from there. So, verse 22. After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside. And he remained there with them, and he was baptizing. John, John the Baptist, was also baptizing at Aenon near Salem, because water was plentiful there, and people were coming and being baptized, for John had not yet been put into prison. And then a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John, and they said to him, Rabbi, teacher, he who was with you across the Jordan, talking about Jesus, To whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing, and all are going to him. So stop there for a second. Think about what's happening, right? So by this time, Jesus already has a following. He has, like, a lot of people that are are interested in what he's doing. People are starting to see that he's sort of different than any other teacher. He's doing miracles. He's doing a lot of different things than John the Baptist did. And so as you can imagine, it's attracted a lot of attention. Like, people are like, dude, what is this guy about? We want to go see... uh, what he's doing. And so all the attention that was on John the Baptist, because John the Baptist was like the man, right? He was, he was the prophet and, and all this stuff, all, all the attention that was on him has been shifted to Jesus himself. And John the Baptist had spent his whole life, his whole ministry devoted to proclaiming the coming of Jesus Christ. So Jesus comes onto the scene performing miracles and all this kind of stuff. And people stop flocking to John the Baptist as much. They start flocking to Christ. So really, he's done what the Lord has called him to do. He's done his task in ministry. He's completed it. He's like, man, I finished what I was supposed to do. I was supposed to point people to Christ. But his disciples, his friends, don't really like it. So they start like getting angry for him, right? They're like, dude, all these people are following this other guy now, right? They, they start to like go to bat for him. Um, they try to get him some justice in a way. Um, and so they kind of get, get mad for him because they think that John the Baptist like, deserves to have all of these followers and deserves to have some attention. And this is actually a pretty natural reaction that a lot of us have when we think about it. Um, when we feel like, like people that we're close with, they aren't getting what we feel like they deserve or they get wronged in some way. Like we want to go to bat for them. We want to go fight for them, right? Um, and I like recently this this happened to me. I, I had this reaction um, because my a, a friend of mine, a really good friend of mine, just got asked to leave his church. He's a worship leader friend of mine. He just they they fired him with no real reason. And um, so we were talking about it on the phone, and I was like, dude, like he was telling me about the whole situation. I'm like, dude, that's not right, man. You know what? You need to go up. In, you know what? I'm gonna call him. I'm gonna go up in there. I'm gonna give him a call. I'm gonna tell him. You know, like I started getting angry for him. Um, like angrier than I would get for myself. I, I get angry, you know, for people that I'm close to. And so we do this all the time. This is what's happening with John the Baptist and his followers. They're thinking like, he deserves the glory. He deserves the glory, right? He deserves a little taste of the glory. He, he deserves the, the glory for, for all his ministry. Like they think he deserves more followers and more notoriety and all these things. And so... The problem, of course, though, is that the purpose of John the Baptist's entire ministry was not for him to get the glory. The purpose was for him to point others to Christ who would get the glory. So if you think about it, this problem, even though it's a natural tendency that people have, it's actually a sinful one, right? So the gospel says we don't deserve anything, right? So when we have this tendency to think that we or people that we're close to deserve something, 
It's really a sinful tendency. We, we don't deserve anything at all. And the gospel says we were dead in our sins. We didn't deserve anything, but Christ gave us what we didn't deserve, right? And so this way of thinking is a very worldly way of thinking. Like me getting angry for my, for my friend seems righteous and, and good and like a noble thing. Like, yeah, man, I'm going to go, you know, I'm going to tell you what that seems like. Yeah, you should do that. Really, it's not what Christ, what Christ modeled, and it's really not what he's asking us to do, right? The, the glory always goes to him. So when we think about it, we find ourselves responding in ways like this all the time. Um, when we, like, we think we've worked so hard for so long, right? We deserve a pay raise, or we deserve not to get caught at a red light, or we, like, deserve all these things, or my family deserves, you know, all this, my fam- like we look at other families that have like more or less kids and we're like, oh, we deserve more kids. So we, we act like this and we say we deserve things when in reality we don't. And for us as a worship team, we can kind of transfer that mentality into uh, how we relate with other people in the congregation. Um, and even how we relate to each other. Like we can have a tendency to think that we deserve a compliment after service on Sunday. Um, We can have a tendency to think that we deserve to uh, serve more often, right? Or that we deserve more breaks more often, right? It can go both ways. Um, Or that we deserve to not have to come as early as we do sometimes when we skip rehearsal, right? So we we have all these things that we think that, that people owe us. And the reality... No one owes us anything. In fact, the Lord didn't even owe us anything at all. And so in this situation, John the Baptist actually seemed like he deserved some glory and some notoriety. He seemed like he should be getting some followers, right? Um, But look at his response. We'll we'll move on. His disciples sort of recognized that, that he had done his ministry, but this is the posture he takes. So John answered, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it's given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom, the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him and rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. And he says the famous line, he must increase, I must decrease. And so think about the humility that he shows here, right? He says to his friends, you think I deserve to have all these followers, but a person doesn't really deserve to receive anything. Anything that's given to him, he's received from Christ, uh, from heaven, from God. And then he says that, basically he says, this was the point of my ministry. I'm not the Christ, he is. And then he compares himself to the best man at a wedding, right? So he says, um, it's like the, the friend of the bridegroom who stands before him and he rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. If you think about it, this is, this is a perfect comparison because the whole job of the best man at a wedding is what? To get the groom ready to be married, right? To like prep him, to hype him up, to like calm him down if he needs it, what, whatever happens. And then when the, when the time of the ceremony comes... The, the best man is there in front of everybody and the, or sorry, the, 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 gro- the groom is there in front of everybody. And the only job for the best man at that point is to get out of the way, right? So the photographer can get their pictures with him out of the way, right? That's the job of the best man, to promote, promote, promote the groom and then to get out of the way when the time is right. And this is what John the Baptist is saying he did his whole life in ministry is to promote Jesus Christ. And when Jesus Christ enters on the scene, his only job is to get out of the way. That's why he says, my joy is now complete. He's like, my work is done. My ministry is finished. Christ must increase. I must decrease. Jesus becomes greater. I become less. And it's a beautiful posture of humility. It's actually a a posture that points to the gospel itself, right? Um, So what does this mean for us? If, If John the Baptist a great minister and this wonderful like hero of faith in the Bible. If John the Baptist took this posture, then how much more should we? And that's 
if you think about it, that's what we're doing as a team, is that our, our job each and every week is to promote, promote, promote Jesus Christ and to get out of the way, right? So when we think like we deserve the glory, we need to think about that actual mentality and, and how it's actually not a biblical one, right? When we think that we're there to show our skills and we think that we're there to um, have people tell us how flawless it was and how people have people encourage us and there's nothing wrong with that, right? There's nothing wrong with saying thank you when people encourage you either. Like, it's, thank you. That, that it's, it's helpful and it's encouraging. But if that's the reason we're on the team, then we've missed the point, right? Our job is like the best man of a wedding or the maid of honor at a wedding. Our job is to promote, 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 and then get out of the way on Sundays. And so hopefully that's what we do as a team is that we promote Jesus Christ in all things. Um, the, uh, the second bit of the verse, like basically we, we won't finish this whole thing out, but Jesus or, or John the Baptist just basically after that explains how amazing Christ is and why he's worth promoting, right? So he says in verse 31, he, Jesus, he comes from above, is above all. And if he, John, who is of earthly things, belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way, then he, Jesus, who comes from heaven, is above all. And he bears witness to what he has seen as heard, yet no one receives his testimony. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. For if he who God has sent utters the words of God, he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into, it, into his hand. Whoever believes the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. So John the Baptist just takes it right back to the, to the gospel and starts pointing towards Christ in all things. And that's, that's my hope as a team is that we would be able to point people only to Jesus Christ and that people wouldn't actually see us or any of the other stuff and that they would see him clearly. And so moving on into like how we do this, practically how do we do this? Like, yes, like be humble, right? Um, but don't be like sad, humble, like, oh, you know, it, it, pe people tell you things and there's a way to be humble that's like fake, right? And there's a way to be humble that's like, Oh, you know, actually, no, I suck, right? That's, don't say that. Or, or like, actually, no, no, all, you know, all glory to God. And you hang your head and, like, there's this weird Christian thing that we do. So that's, that's weird, right? No, nobody wants that. But, but being able to say, thank you, I'm glad that I can serve, right? Thank you, um, that's encouraging to me. Thank you for the encouragement. I really appreciate that. Um, I'm glad that, that it ministered to you. I'm glad the songs ministered to you, right? Being able to do that in a God-honoring way is important when we interact with people. And then just in a really like practical sense, um, a way that we keep Christ at the center is through our liturgy. So this is kind of what I wanted to dive into tonight. And um, this is sort of the rest of it will be just really practical. Um, so liturgy just being, uh, there it is. Liturgy just meaning like the order of things or the flow of the service, how we structure uh, the time when people come into the doors and then the time when they leave. Um, and there's a certain way that, that I'll try to order things and song select and pick things in order to keep Christ like literally at the center of the service. So you think about like the middle point of a service. You have, you know, a couple songs and then like a bumper video and a sermon and like whatever, the whole thing. Somewhere right in the middle somewhere is where we want Christ. Um, because in, in essence, what we want to do is we want to tell the gospel story from the time people come in to the time people leave. We want to tell, okay, Christ called us. He, uh, the, the work on the cross happened. He saved us. He works in our lives. And so how should we respond, right? So that's the gospel story in a nutshell. And we can do this through like the ways that we think about song choice. So I try to classify our uh, songs into one of four types. So they're either songs of gathering, which um, those are like typically songs that are 
you know, they, they have like the, because it's like usually you do it at the beginning. So it's usually kind of more upbeat, but not always necessarily. But songs like Center My Life, Lord, you know, Tune My Heart, Sing Your Praises, Teach Me, Lord, With All Your Wisdom, Center My Life, um, The Lord Our God, Who You Say I Am, songs like that that are like, this is, you know, what we want to turn our affections towards. Um, and then you have songs of testimony. Um, so these are songs like basically that say what the Lord does and how he works in our life. So that, that's like, like songs like All I Have is Christ, Lord, I Need You, um, songs of testimony. Come Thou Fount, maybe? Yeah, Blessing of the Lord in Our Lives, right? So songs of testimony just talk about what the Lord is doing, how he's working in our lives. And then, um, and then we have songs of gospel. So gospel songs, not like the genre, but the, uh, the type of song, right? Th- these are songs like, that just paint the fullest picture of the gospel. So from like Christ coming, death, burial, resurrection, eternal security, right? So a song of gospel presentation would be like In Christ Alone, Man of Sorrows, um, Oh, praise the name, maybe. Yeah, oh, praise the name. You know, songs that talk about, like, they, they create, like, a full, like, almost chronological picture of Christ and what he did, right? Uh, Living Hope, that's a good one for that, too. So they have, typically they have, like, three verses because they're, like, death, burial, resurrection, or, or whatever it is. Um, it's a what? Yeah, yeah. Build My Life is more of, like, a response song, I would say. But yeah, so that's the other one is response. So songs of response. These would be like, um, like exalted over all, right? Uh, great are you, Lord. How great thou art. Um, songs, songs of response are typically like aimed mostly at the Lord and don't talk about us as much. So they're not talking about like what he's doing for us or how he helps us, but they're talking about just who he is, the character of God. So this is kind of like the four... Uh, dumping banks that I throw songs into when we think about how we're doing this on Sundays. Um, and the, the, the biggest one here, like the most important one, obviously, is, is like the gospel songs, which is the songs that proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to his fullest. If we miss like a song of gathering on a Sunday, like it, it's not the end of the world, right? If we miss a gospel song, we've failed. So if we, if we don't sing a song, at least one song each week that presents the gospel clearly of Christ, um, in my mind, we, we messed up, right? That's the most important thing. And so that somewhere in here, like second song, response song after the message, sometime during that time, like either right before or right after the message is usually where we want to put those songs because literally, like physically, Christ at the center of the service, right? Um, and that's the big thing is just being able to paint a picture of the gospel. So he gathers us, he uh, works on our behalf, song of testimony, he saves us. Those can be simultaneous and switched too, right? But he works on our behalf, he saves us, and then how do we respond? We respond to the gospel. Um, so that's just kind of how how I've been thinking through that. I've shared some of that with you guys at like rehearsals and stuff, but I just wanted to share that with a little bit more in depth of just a really practical way that we do that, that we try to keep Christ at the center and we can say, hey, look at Jesus, not us.